sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. James, at the beginning, he talks about troubles and trials. And uh, raise your hand if you got any troubles or trials, and I better see every hand up right now, right? Amen. That's okay, because he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and Perseverance must finish its work in you, so you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So, troubles and trials, everything we raised our hand for, everything I raised my hand for, is God's work in my maturity. Amen.
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory, free us name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. And every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, your name, your name, your name, your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, your name, your name, your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name.
adore you. of lightning, rolls of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you the only wise King. Oh, holy, holy, holy to the Lord God. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Oh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was take a minute here to adore you. You are our everything, Lord. Without you, we are nothing. Without you, we cannot make it through. We acknowledge that today, and we praise you, Lord, for that, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Now ready our hearts, Lord, ready our ears to hear what your word would tell us and teach us today. I ask that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Um, also, I, I wanted to share with you, as you know, um, not too long ago, our church decided to uh, raise some funds for a widow and her family uh, in Kenya. And I wanted to just show you a couple pictures here of um, what that went towards. And so they were able to buy some building material uh, to build her a home, her and her children a home. And so there was some of the lumber used for that, um, the roofing material, uh, the metal there. And um, there's her and her, her children. And they had started, the, obviously, the process of building the home there. And the gentleman on the very right, that is Pastor Evans. Uh, that's the one that I communicate with back and forth quite often, and he's the one that sends me um, sends me photos, and, and we talk here and there, and he'll call me every now and then. Um, he even sends me receipts of everything that they purchased with our money that we sent to them so that, you know, they make sure. They want to make sure that we know everything uh, is legit, but uh, great guy and uh, just wonderful. Um, let's see. There we go. And there's the, the, obviously the roof is on. Uh, gentlemen are starting to build the, the walls out of the clay. And, uh, and then let's see, yep, there's, it's pretty much done there. Uh, best picture I could find of that. And then the family, of course, in front, they have some, a door and some windows in as well now. Um, but um, thank you so much for helping them. Um, we, we probably can't even fathom just how much that means to them. Um, and having a home uh, there. So uh, thank you for that. We appreciate that. I know that they do, and Pastor Evans is very grateful 
as well and wanted me to let you guys know uh, always. They're always in prayer for us, and we're definitely lifting up in, them up in our prayers as well. So continue to pray for them. Um, this, uh, this week, we are beginning a series um, on the seven churches in Revelation. And, uh, but before we get into Jesus' words to these churches, it's important for us to cu- just try to cover chapter 1 um, because it serves as really an introduction to us. And I think it's important for the church to learn about the message that Jesus gave to the churches because I truly believe that all of the world events, even with COVID and the pestilence um, going on in the world we've experienced, should really serve It should serve as a wake-up call for the church. Um, Unfortunately, the church has grown a little bit too comfortable in our buildings and our programs uh, while living in a world that's full of idolatry and immorality and secularism. Uh, And while buildings and programs, listen, they're they're good, they're fine in and of themselves, they're not wrong, Uh, the problem is, is in some ways they've become the main focus of the church Um, And if we don't have these certain things going on, if the church isn't a big, giant church, well, then they're just not successful or they're not doing what they need to do because they're not really meeting the needs of the people when truly it's God that meets the needs of people and it's through Christ that he meets the most important need. Um, Programs and buildings can help. They are tools. But in some ways, they've become the main focus of the church all in an effort to really just simply try and compete with... um, the different forms of outside entertainment in the world for the attention of people. Uh, And the church has really lost its compass over the years, I'm afraid. And, uh, you know, on November 27th, 1989, the day when communism fell in uh, Czechoslovakia, a Methodist church in the capital of the city, of the capital city of Prague, they put up a sign. And uh, for decades, the church wasn't allowed uh, to have any form of of, uh, you know, pub- publicity, basically. And, and, uh, but when the movement and the momentum of freedom started really going there, the Christians posted just three words on a sign, which really summarized not only the New Testament in general, but the book of Revelation, I would say, probably in particular. Um, and these are the words that they posted. The Lamb wins. The Lamb wins. Now, their point was not that, you know, Jesus had unexpectedly won some victory recently, but that Jesus had been reigning in triumph the whole time. Um, And and Richard Buse, he explained this. He said, Christ is always the winner. He was winning even when the church seemed to lie crushed under the apparatus of totalitarian rule. Now, at least, it could be proclaimed. The church... We are supposed to proclaim that the Lamb won and that the Lamb of God is winning. First, we are obviously here to worship God. We've come here into this place to worship God, to praise God, to to come to know God more. But then out of that, we're to reach the world and we are supposed to be proclaiming the message that Jesus sent Um, that God sent his only son Jesus to die for them so that they could have eternal life. And and from then that, we are to disciple them, teaching the things that Jesus taught us. Um, We aren't here as a church just to try and make people comfortable or to have a good time, although that can happen. But our goal is not to entertain. That's just not the goal of, of the church in And the messages from Jesus to the churches, I think, really can help right the ship and get the church focused on the Lamb of God, uh, no matter what we face in the world, no matter how difficult it is or how good it is, um, we need to focus on the Lamb of God. And so, if you will, open up your Bibles to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. This book can cause a little bit of fear when we talk about it, when we say the word. A lot of people use, I mean, listen, Revelation, the book uses a lot of imagery. Um, It paints uh, a lot of different pictures of end times events. And when you hear the name of the book, the book of Revelation, we almost instantly think of 
the mark of the beast, or we think of the Antichrist, or we think of the tribulation period, um, or, you know, end times, like in the apocalypse. And it was funny because I had sent out a text to Kasha and Michelle and said, hey, this is what we're going to be, I'm going to be touching on this week and the series moving forward. And he sent a, a jokingly a comment back and said, okay, I'm going to look for the most hardcore apocalyptic songs we can find, you know, <laughs> because that is kind of what we think of. We think of this, you know, we think of the apocalypse and I get it, you know, and and while this book does reveal information on that, I want you to notice the first words of chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. So this book isn't primarily about revealing details of the end times, although it includes some of those things. It's a book that further reveals who Jesus is. Because remember, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about him, isn't it? Well, Revelation is no different. Well, you might say, well, what about the Gospels? You know, don't they, don't they reveal Jesus? Absolutely, they reveal Jesus to us at his first coming um, in the flesh, dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. But Revelation shows us an exalted Jesus, an exalted Christ, Lord of his church, the judge of this fallen world that we live in and the sin that is in it, as well as taking back what belongs to him. That's what Revelation shows us about, about Christ. And, and uh, so uh, he's going to be in Revelation. We're going to see a ruling and reigning king. And so this book isn't just about the end time. It reveals Jesus to us. So before we go further, let's, let's just get a little bit of background um, for the study. It is... It's 95 A.D., okay? Um, Domitian is Caesar of the Roman Empire. Ephesus is the third largest city in the empire, and this is where Domitian actually chose to build his first temple so that people could worship him. Now, emperor worship wasn't necessarily real popular before that. Um, he's the first Caesar to claim that he is a god and should be worshipped by the people, although maybe some of them before that probably acted like it. Uh, but around the same time, there's someone else living in Ephesus. And the only surviving member of the original 12 disciples, the OG of the 12 disciples, right? And uh, the writer of the Gospel of John, um, the Apostle John, he is there. He's living in Ephesus at the time. He's an older guy now, but still proclaiming Jesus. And so you can imagine that the self-proclaimed God Caesar, Domitian, doesn't care for John so much. And uh, so he has him arrested for preaching the faith in the one true God, which wasn't Domitian. And so they tried to kill John. And what's great about that is they couldn't kill him. He wouldn't die. John was protected. He was scourged. He was boiled in oil. He was stoned. You name it. Uh, things happened to John, but he didn't die. So John then is exiled to the island of Patmos, uh, which is located in the Aegean Sea. It's about 40 miles off the coast of modern-day Turkey. Uh, I was teaching this to our young adults on Sunday night, and I told them all, pull out your apps on your phone, your map app, and type in Patmos, Greece, and it's still there. Uh, we could take a church field trip if you'd like. Um, it's still there. It's a real place, uh, 40 miles outside the coast of modern-day Turkey, and uh, John is one of the many political prisoners that were exiled there, uh, most of which would never leave the island alive. And so you can imagine things are looking pretty, pretty hopeless, pretty bleak. You know, what's the future for John? What, what's the future for the church? Um, what's the future for the gospel? Why would John suffer if he is the most beloved disciple? And so, you know, you could, you could just see and maybe think about that and just wonder. John's probably got a lot of thoughts and questions. And, and you know, church, we shouldn't be surprised by trials, as, as Kasha mentioned today during our worship, and as though something strange, you know, was happening to us. The opposite to modern prosperity teaching, like, like John, we should expect difficulty. We should actually expect Difficult times and trials because, specifically because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus promised. He said the one who endures to the end will be saved. Endure what? 
hard times, trials, tribulation. Paul said that if we endure, we will also reign with him. So while exiled on Patmos, John receives a visit. He receives a vision and, uh, that we call the book of Revelation. It is given to John to tell him that, yes, there's a future. Yes, there's a future. Jesus Christ will be coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who reject him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn over him and because of him. Amen? That's our hope. The Lamb wins. Jesus has not been defeated. Jesus will come again. And John wrote this down, and he understands the comfort that is coming. And so take a look at verses 10 to 11. He writes, well, let's see if it's going to work. Verses 10 to 11 here. And I want you to see this. You can follow along in your Bibles, of course, as well. There we go. Thank you. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he says, Unto Ephesus, this is one of the churches, it goes and gives the list, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now understand something, these are real, actual churches with actual people made up of congregations in actual cities. And uh, two of the seven, Smyrna and Philadelphia, they are the only ones commended by Christ as faithful. The others have a message calling them to repentance. And the final one, Laodicea, is so disgusting that Jesus would spit it out of his mouth in a symbolic way of saying, it's disgusting to me. These are real churches with real people who identify as Christians. And John tells us in 1 John 5 that it's our faith that makes us overcomers. And, and so listen, church, understand the faith Faith involves repentance. You can't get around that. You cannot not repent of your sin and be saved. Faith requires, it is a prerequisite, repentance is, of faith. And, and, and so saving faith is when we repent of our sins to receive the gift of eternal life. You know, I, I've heard many people say, I've asked, you know, what about so-and-so? And... -so? and and they say, well, yeah, you know, I think they're saved. They say they believe, and, and, uh, but if they haven't repented. See, that is key. There's a, a repentance that needs to happen. And, and so then we receive the gift of eternal life. But, listen, there's a continual work of God's love and mercy and grace in our lives that involves God's discipline and our continued repentance as we grow in faith. That's sanctification. That is a process of becoming like Christ. And, and we don't always think of a church repenting, but that's exactly what Jesus was calling the early church to do. That's what he's calling the church of today to do. If you're a Christian and you're sitting in this, in this room together, the Lord is calling the church to repent of sin in our life on a continual basis. We need to repent. He's calling the church to do that today. And you say, well, I don't understand why. How does it, how could these seven churches here, how does that relate to the church today? Well, that's the reason for the number seven. The number seven is meant to mean completion. It's meant to mean all-encompassing. It wasn't just seven churches. It was the church of that day. Yes, he sent letters to those seven, but it was for the, the church my friends, it's for the church today as well. We live in the church age. It's still the church age. Now, if you were to take the sins of the seven churches there and you were to make a list, that list would include sexual immorality, idolatry, compromise with the world, tolerance of sin, false teaching, false teachers, hypocrisy, seduction, and preaching prosperity. Do you think that relates today? 
It absolutely does. The church then existed in a pagan world, and these sins were in the church. Jesus called those sins, he called them teachings that come from Satan. That's what he called them. These are the same sins of the church today. And Jesus is calling the church today to repentance. We're living in the church age. We're also living in the end times. And the church needs to right the ship and repent. And the message to the seven churches is not, again, just meant for them. His message is for the whole church the whole, uh, as a whole today. Christians are, listen, we're so busy asking God and, and fighting for our political freedoms that when really the Christians who are the church need to be hearing the words of Jesus and repenting. We need to get ourselves right. The church needs to get right and right the ship. And so John hears this voice, and look at verses 12 to 16. Look at what he says. He describes the revealed Christ, and he says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a white garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had his right hand, in his right hand, seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. What happened to the kind, gentle, little seven-pound, six-ounce baby Jesus? <laughs> Amen. You know, what's going on? This isn't, this isn't the Jesus we're used to. Well, the book of Revelation is filled with symbolism, of course. Uh, some is, ex is explained to us, like verse 20. Um, other symbolism we can figure out from other scriptures that help us make sense of it. And then there are some we're just not 100% sure about. But Jesus' description here is very interesting. His white hair shows us his holiness and his wisdom. His eyes as a flame of fire show us his ability to see right down into our soul. Makes sense because he's the one that's able to judge 100% purely and justly. His feet are glowing bronze. You know what's interesting about this is that the altar in the temple where the sacrifices to the Lord would be made and burned, it was covered with bronze. And all the utensils that were used at the altar were made of bronze. And then many of the animals sacrificed on the altar were sacrificed to atone for a person's personal sin. It was a personal sin sacrifice. There were many different forms of sacrifice back then, if you do a study on that. But this was particularly done for a personal sin. And here we have Jesus, red hot glowing bronze feet, and understanding that, that he's on a mission. And that mission is divine judgment here. And we see this in most of Revelation. This isn't, yeah, this, this is not the revealed Jesus in, in, in the New Testament when he first came in the flesh. This is an exalted Christ judge, king, reigning. And so verse 15 says that his voice is like the sound of many waters. I think of crashing ocean waves, you know, against rocks or the roar of a waterfall. You know, you go up north and you stand next to the rivers that are rushing and the waterfall crashing and just the sound of that and, and how it's just nothing's going to stop it. Nothing gets in the way of that. This is the voice of authority. It's the voice of power. It accepts nothing less than submission and reverence when you hear it. That's the sound of his voice. And then out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. Now, this is more familiar to us, um, you know, because Hebrews 4 and 12, it gives us some meaning. God's word is alive and it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, even judging the thoughts and the intents and the attitudes of the heart. Think about that. The late Warren Wearsby, he wrote these words. He said, he was not the gentle Jewish carpenter that sentimentalists like to think about, 
or sing about. He is the risen, glorified, exalted Son of God, the priest king who has the authority to judge all mankind. And look at how John responds. This is how we should be responding. Because I think we read Revelation and we think about Jesus, and I think too often, Christians, you know what we do? We just get really lazy and lackadaisical about who God really is. We get kind of lazy about really the truth of Jesus, and all we want to think about and appreciate is that, oh, we can come before him boldly. That is true, but <laughs> we need to be careful. We get so just, we sit in our pews, and I mean, I'm looking out at some of you, and I mean, I don't know. Are you a little indifferent to what's being said? I don't know. Is it really sinking in? I don't know. I hope so. I want you to look at how John responds in verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This is similar to Isaiah 6. He had a vision that he was ushered into the throne room in the presence of Almighty God, and he falls on his face saying, Woe is me! Woe is me! I am undone. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. Church, I need you to hear this. When we stand before Almighty God, we know one thing, one thing. He is God, and we are not. We are, when it's revealed, truly, we see ourselves. We're, we're dirty, we're rotten, we're no good, we're filthy sinners. I mean, that's really what it is. We deserve punishment. We deserve the wrath of God for the condition that we are in. We instantly become aware of his holiness and power and our deep conviction of sinfulness before him. That's what John felt. That's what Isaiah described. This is God's, this is God's absolute holiness compared to our sinfulness. That is the drastic difference that apart from Jesus, we don't have anything. We're, you know, and... Absolutely. You know, many of us are told our whole lives that we're good. You know, we're good. We're important. And, and that might be true when compared to the fallen world standard. But when we're compared to God's holiness and his standard and who he is, and we just get a glimpse of his holiness, of, uh, of the almighty God, we instantly realize we're not good at all. Apart from Jesus, we're sinners, completely unworthy of his goodness, completely. Who am I? You know, I, I was studying this, and I thought to myself, who am I apart from Jesus? Who am I apart from Christ? Um, and listen, this is important. Knowing God, and in turn, knowing who I am apart from, from him, that's important. It's important for, for us to understand it. The problem is that a lot of, a lot of folks think, well, you know, I'm okay. I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm okay. No, we're not. <laughs> we're not okay. God's honest truth is that we are sinners. That's really the truth. In Isaiah's vision, he realized his condition, and he said, woe is me, I'm undone. That word woe, you know what that word is? That's a funeral term. It's, it's what a widow would cry out when she lost her husband. And she realized, she would say, woe is me, it's over for me, my life is, I know it is done and over, I'm ruined, I'm as good as dead. Now why am I trying so hard to explain this today? Well, if you learned anything, I, I please learn this, he is God and we are not. And apart from Jesus, we like the widow, woe is me, I'm ruined, I'm as good as dead. Apart from Jesus, I don't have any business being in the presence of God. Apart from Christ, in the presence of God, I died. That's what happens. No business even saying his name apart from Christ. No business going to him with my requests apart from Jesus. None. He is God. He is holy, holy, holy. I don't deserve his grace. I don't deserve his love. I don't deserve his mercy. What I truly deserve is God's wrath and his judgment. That's what I deserve. 
and the truth of what I've tried to explain, that doesn't even come close to the spiritual reality of the situation. But you know what's so amazing is because of the seriousness of our condition that Jesus chose to go to and endure the cross and the shame for you and me. Jesus hanging on the cross after being tortured and beaten. You see, that's actually what sin looks like. The image of him and what he went through, that's what sin looks like. It's, it's dirty, it's gross, it's disgusting, it's naked, it's shameful. Remember, Jesus wasn't actually clothed on the cross. He was naked, and that was part of the horror and the shame of it. And that's what we look like in God's presence. Everything in us, everything about me, everything about you, all the things we've ever done or thought or said, it's all naked and laid before God. He sees it all. He knows all about it. It's disgusting. It's shameful. And yet because of how bad it is, that's why Jesus came. And that's why he died for us. So everything about us is laid before him. And so when John saw the glowing presence of Jesus, his white hair, the feet like brass, his eyes like fire, his voice, the sound of many waters, what does John do? He face plants himself in the ground. Why? Because when you're in the presence of the almighty, glorified, resurrected Jesus, you are completely aware of who he is and who you are. But then look at verse 17. Guys, not a more beautiful picture. Look at this. Then when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. Amen. Don't deserve it. And you know, and you, you remember this about John. He knows Jesus. He believed in Christ. He trusted his life to him. He's not apart from Christ. He's in Christ. And that is what changed it all. That's what changes everything for us. John has a relationship with him. And when we confess our sins to Christ and we trust in who he is and what he's done, we too can enter into that relationship with Jesus and it changes everything. We're forgiven we're accepted by God, and instead of God turning away from us, he reaches out his hand to us, he puts his hand on us because we're his, and he saves us, and he forgives us, and he makes us clean. His work on the cross has made us accepted into God's family. Isn't that great? And just to seal the deal, guys, Jesus says in the last part of verse 17 and 18, he says, I am the first and the last, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And if you're wondering what the difference between hell and death is, death is the condition of the dead. Hell is the place of the dead. And Jesus says that he has the keys to both. You know what that means? That means he determines who goes there and who doesn't. He has authority over death and hell. And I wonder if, you know, I, I wonder if he was kind of letting John know, John, it's okay if you're feeling like Isaiah <laughs> right now and you're thinking you're a dead man. I hold the keys. You're okay. You don't have to be afraid. Are you okay today? We need to know who Jesus is. We need to know who we are apart from him. We need to see our need, that we are undone and unclean, and see our need to trust in Jesus. Because having a relationship with him is what changes everything. It gives meaning, and it gives hope for our future. It gives purpose to our lives that we still live today. And this is 
This is only truly realized when we have a true awareness of Jesus. We need to see Him in all of His glory, to fall on our faces before Him. You know, I, I think about this and I, I, I think of immediately, you know who I think of? I think of my little nephew Aaron when he comes and prays for us sometimes. I don't know if you, you notice what he does when he prays. Some of you probably close your eyes, but when he prays, he always goes down on one knee. Appropriate. I mean, obviously, on our faces would be appropriate, but then you probably wouldn't be able to hear him praying. So one knee is good. One knee is good. To fall on our faces before him, see him for who he is. When we do, our lives fall under his authority. When you surrender to Christ, you fall under his authority. You'll be renewed. You'll be revived to be about him. You'll be revived to be about his work and building his kingdom. Instead of our own little temporary Garden of Edens that we're all trying to build down here. So after this incredible sight and comfort from Jesus, John gets up off the ground to hear the command in verse 19. Look at what he says. Jesus says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And it's with these words that we actually have an outline for the book of Revelation. Um, what you've seen, referring to Revelation chapter 1. What is now, referring to chapters 2 and 3, and the letters to the seven churches. And then what will take place later on, and that refers to the rest of the book of Revelation, chapters 4 to 22. It, it, it's all to give us a better understanding of Jesus. He wants us to know him. He wants us to know him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And I guess my question for you today is simply this. Do you know Jesus? Have you grown complacent? Lukewarm. That's the last church we'll talk about. But where are you? Do you know him today? Bow with me for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for not leaving us in the dark. You want us to know the way, the truth, and the life through your son, Jesus. Things will one day, history, one day, it's coming to an end. Lord, right now, help each and every one of us to evaluate where we are with you. Do we really know you? Do we really know who we are apart from you? Help us to see our need for you. Impress it upon our hearts just how important it is to know your son, Jesus Christ. And that apart from each of us accepting what you did for us on that cross so many years ago and your resurrection for us and our repentance to turn away from our old lives, that we're left, without that, we're left unforgiven sinners who deserve your judgment and your wrath. Thank you for making a way to save us from that. With eyes closed and heads bowed, no one looking around, if you need to give your life to Jesus today, I want you to do this. I just want you to pray to him this morning. I want you to just simply talk to him as he listens to you from your heart and just simply say something like this. God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I need your forgiveness right now. And so I repent. I turn away from my old life and I turn to you right now in this moment before you. And I trust you with my life. I surrender my life to you. I want a relationship with you from this day forward. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Forgive me, come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior today. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand with us today? times I
grace everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all flame. Your will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. In my heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and grace become my embrace. To love you from the inside out, everlasting. Your life will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out lord my soul cries out Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. In my heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and grace become my embrace to love you from the inside out everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out lord my soul Cries out from the end, sighed out, Lord, my soul cries out. Father, I pray that our soul will cry out for your guidance, your direction, your healing, your touch. And I pray that from our inside to our outside, that will become known as we follow, as we worship, as we pursue you. Amen. Have a blessed week.